Welcome to this podcast about Hilton Head Island and the Low Country. In this episode, we are talking with Jim Chafin. Jim will share with us his introduction to Charles Frazier, his experiences working at Sea Pines in the early years, and why you always had to be careful while sailing with Mr. Frazier on his boat, the Compass Rose, as we travel down 278 to Lighthouse Road. Jim Chafin spent 10 years early in his career working for the Sea Pines Corporation. Jim is a founding partner of Chafin Light. Chafin Light develops and operates high quality recreation and resort communities. Chafin Light's mission statement is to create authentic, natural, and livable places that foster rewarding life experiences. A few of their developments are Snowmass Village, Iron Bridge, and Roaring Fork Club in Colorado, and Spring Island, Kalawasi Island, and to Chessie Creek Club in South Carolina. Jim is a past chairman of the board of trustees of the Urban Land Institute, a nonprofit research and education institute that is dedicated to responsible land use and supported and directed by its 40,000 plus members. Jim Chafin co-chaired with Charleston Mayor Joe Riley, a statewide collaborative smart growth initiative in South Carolina, seeking to identify and foster patterns of growth that are economically sound, environmentally sensitive, and supportive of community livability. Jim, welcome to the show. Well, thanks, Jay, and thanks for having me, and thank you for bringing a focus on the history and evolution of Hilton Head Island and Sea Pines as a special human settlement. Oh, it's our pleasure. It's it's great to kind of delve back into how this all began and share that with the, the people that listen to this podcast. Jim, share with us how you were introduced to Sea Pines and your introduction to Charles Frazier. Well, I was uh, had... <laughs> Spent summers during college working with a good friend, Jim Light, uh, in the summer when he had gotten out of the Harvard Business School and gone to work for Charles. I had was about uh, two thirds of the way through a PhD and was just getting out of the Army Medical Corps when Jim called and asked me if I'd come spend a weekend with him down at a place he'd gone to work at called Hilton Head Island. I agreed that I would be happy to come. It'd be good to catch up, but I was definitely going back to finish the degree, but I would look forward to coming and visiting with him. So I came to to Hilton Head and Jim introduced me to Charles and started to uh, introduce me to what was going on in Sea Pines. It, It actually began our first introduction was in a place we used to call the Hog Lounge (laughs) at the Plantation Club or the History of Golf Bar, as it was called. Uh, And as I walked in, I was completely surprised. I was expecting to see this uh, legendary figure of a uh, much older man at that point. Charles was 40 years old, if you can imagine, and quickly became apparent to me uh, how smart and curious he was. So it it, uh, was a fascinating conversation. And I went from thinking that I was simply going to be getting a somewhat of an interview process to being in a very interesting, fascinating intellectual conversation about the evolution of human settlements. Now, Mr. Frazier did not want to just to sell lots and land. He actually wanted to create an experience for those who came to Sea Pines. How forward thinking was that and how much attention to detail did he put into each facet of the development? There are lots of different things about uh, Charles's personality that are very interesting, but he, to me, one of the first things I realized was uh, how smart he was and how what an insatiable curiosity he had about human behavior uh, and how people entertained themselves. You know, here was a guy who had spent a couple of summers working on Hilton Head because his father had an investment in a timber syndicate on Hilton Head. And he was not about sports or anything. Uh, I never saw Charles with a golf club or a tennis racket in his hands or saw him walking or swimming in the uh, in the beach he he just was very curious about human behavior and how people entertained themselves and was curious i mean that that was absolutely clearly part of 
what was going on when he was not just about doing a subdivision or carving up lots on an oceanfront piece of property. His planning was about the experience uh, people would have, you know, not just what the place looked like, but what would the experience be? There was a, for instance, uh, just keep in mind, this is back in the 60s, and he had given up 50 feet for every 500 feet as an easement to the beach so that second, third, fourth, fifth row houses and even further back into the interior, people had a feeling of access to the ocean. And many of those third, fourth, and fifth row houses would say to people, they say, well, where do you live? Oh, we live on the ocean at Sea Pines, where normally the only people who would say that would be people who clearly had an ocean front. But he wanted everybody to feel like they had to access. And this whole thing about deed covenants, and I have heard him talk about it and and think that it was one of the things that got him curious about talking to his father about doing something on Hilton Head. He was in law school and he heard a lecture about deed covenants. And he kind of raised his hand and said, wait a minute, you mean you can sell property to somebody and still tell them what they can and cannot do with it? And given his insatiable curiosity, he said, well, my goodness, you know, I wonder how we can apply that to the development of a special, beautiful place. And and that applied to both tree removal and house siting. So that was his curiosity separating him from a typical subdivision developer. It really takes a special person to create experiences that they're not necessarily interested in or involved in for somebody to create world-class golf in Hilton right. and world-class tennis. They had the family yes. cup uh, tennis tournaments down there. They have the heritage, which is still going on today and is, will continue probably forever to create those experiences when he couldn't play golf and he couldn't play tennis and tried to l- learn a little bit from my understanding, but never really came to ter- I guess he came to terms with the fact that, okay, I can't play these, <laughs> but other people <laughs> like to, and there's an interest in it to actually step out of your own world and create stuff for other people really takes a, a special person. Yes. And this insatiable curiosity, why do people like this so much? And and being open to attracting a Stan Smith to be the first director of tennis in a sport he knew nothing about. But what he knew was that Stan had won Wimbledon. Here's a guy who didn't play golf. And yet when we, we were doing the Harbortown golf course and, of course, getting Pete and Alice Stein and Jack Nicholas together to uh, do the course, it's, you know, he, he, he started doing research on what is it about this game? And lo and behold, he discovered that the first golf course in America was in Charleston called Harleston Green. And he started doing research and he couldn't find that there was a country club called Harleston Green or whatever. And Charles then got a fellow golf historian to start helping him do research. Turns out he wound up being able to get the charter for Halston Green. It is in the Harbor Town Clubhouse. And therefore, when Jack Nicholas came to Charles and said, you know, Charles, I, this is more special than we ever thought it would be. And I really think that uh, it ought to be part of the professional golf tour. And I just heard there was a cancellation on the tour over Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, would you be interested? And we all thought that the Jack was dreaming because there were about 3,800 people living on Hilton Head at that point, 1968-69. And lo and behold, the first heritage was that Thanksgiving weekend. And Arnold Palmer, as you know, won it. And with Arnold Palmer winning it, it made the cover of Sports Illustrated the next week uh, with an article saying, course with rare bite. And the and always infamous picture of an alligator. (laughs) But uh, I can tell you from a marketing perspective, for the two weeks after that Sports Illustrated article came out, we received more inquiries at Sea Pines than we had in the prior year. (laughs) So it it was a, a launch. And as you know, the heritage has gone on to be so 
much a part of the positioning and marketing of Hilton Head Island. But it, it was Charles just realizing that what is it that people like about this and how did this game get started in Scotland in the first place and when did it come to the United States? It was an example, Jay, of his insatiable curiosity. Uh, and we'll get into this when we talk about the lighthouse and harbor town as well. But uh, uh, he just had this insatiable, why do people like this? Where did it start? So he, he was so much of a genius. He was just curious about everything. It seemed like in the early days, he, you know, a lot of people call it dumb luck. He just had this, this sense of timing. He'd make a decision kind of based on the information he was given and his foresight into what people would want to do. The building of the golf course and landing the heritage, my understanding is they were just racing to get that that course done. Oh, yes. And the, the head of the PGA is calling Pete Dye going, hey, you need to make sure the sand is in the traps for six months before we have the tournament. And Pete Dye's like, oh, yeah, not a problem at all. And they hadn't even built a sand trap yet, let alone put sand in them. And you are exactly right. Yeah. And Nicholas coming up with the opportunity for the tournament and the story of like Pete Dye and his wife, he sent his wife to go build the 13th hole. And I mean, it's just kind of nuts how it all went together. But then the stands. Oh, she did. I mean, Alice, Alice, built the basket yeah <laughs> she built the basket and then the the stan smith story where jim light your partner right. gets some advice from these attorneys they said you need to get a touring pro to help promote sea pines and well who do we hire and they're like go get stan smith and He's like, who's Stan Smith? He's well, he's up and coming. So he goes and tells Mr. Frazier. Mr. Frazier is like, okay, hire him. And then the, then Stan Smith goes and wins Wimbledon in the U.S. Open. You couldn't pick somebody better to represent tennis no. on the island at that point in time than Stan Smith. Oh, and he's still active, still part of the community. We're both on the board uh, together, and uh, and I sit on his charities committee. I mean, I meet with him still twice a year to talk about you know where the contribution from the heritage are going. The Lighthouse Project was known at one point as Fraser's Folly. There was pushback about building it. People were like, why are you building a lighthouse that's not really even functional? And it was nearly scrapped. Would you share that story with us? Yeah, it was. Here we are about the uh, everything being focused toward being a oceanfront beach community and having two golf courses at that point, the Ocean and Sea Marsh course, as they were called then. And Charles had a, just a curiosity about human behavior and where was there a magnet, even though Turtle Lane Cabanos was, his, was another example of of his setting aside something for a gathering spot. First Turtle Lane Cabana building was this wonderful <laughs> cedar log, cedar shake building, a cabin down uh, on the beach. And it was a beach access for everyone, not, not just people living on the beach, but people all over the community had access there. And, and this is a very important point that one of the lessons that Jim and I talk about over and over. And uh, when you think about things that we did out West or things that we've done here, particularly Spring Island, th there are things that we learned 45, 50 years ago from Charles. And one of the best examples is take the best you have and give it to everybody. Look at everything you've got and the amenity in your property and carve it out and give the best to everybody. That's what Turtle Lane Cabanos was. And we did that very much here at a at a place called Bunny Shore, where we took the absolute single best home site, and it is a park for everyone. But Charles was just curious about, well, what, where can we have a gathering spot? I don't want it to just be at the golf club. Then what you are is you're a golf club. You're a golf community. You're not a community that has golf. And a, so a gathering spot was what about over on the marsh side of the island, which, you know, didn't get nearly as much attention as the ocean front side. And also there was this intercoastal waterway going right down by the west side of the island, and we weren't attracting uh, any of that traffic. And he began to just say, okay, where's the best place to create a gathering 
spot. And he brought planners like Stu Dawson <laughs> together and said, okay, what are the, the magnets? What are the things that can bring people together? And if you look at harbors, you know, Palmetto Bay Marina was there, but it wasn't a place that people went and sat or gathered. And if you look at Harbor Town, you've got the Liberty Oak. <laughs> and, and by the way, when, when Stu Dawson and Sasaki had laid out the harbor, they had made a perfectly symmetrical harbor around, but that meant taking down that oak tree. Charles said, no, 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 no. <laughs> and that they resisted, thinking, oh, this is crazy. You're going to just, how many harvests do you see which goes around and all of a sudden butts out for a tree and butts back in and it goes around. But Charles thought that Liberty Oak would be a great, you know, just a gathering plot. And just think of the music that's going on there. And of course, it's his resting spot, very appropriately. And the rocking chairs, well, you don't want people just walking around here. What if they want to just sit and take it in? To him, he was looking for a community gathering spot. And the doubters would say, Charles, Charles, you know, this is a beach resort, a beach place. People don't care about this marsh grass and the river out here. But to Charles, he was saying, it can be more. Why do people go to Portofino? Why do they go to Mallorca? Why do they go to Port Grimaud? They don't have beaches there, but they go there. And where on the and when he would say, "Go to Portofino, go to Mallorca," you know, some of us say, "Well, Charles, where in South Carolina or Georgia, Georgia coast are those places?" Because that's about <laughs> as much as we knew. <laughs> But he was aware of those places, those villages being places that, where people just wanted to be, wanted to gather. So to him, Harbor Town was not a, just about the boats, the harbor, but about the experience of being in Harbor Town and what was that experience. And therefore, you know, you had all these doubters. People felt that uh, it was a, a folly. I mean, who, there had not been a private lighthouse built in the Southeast in 75 years or whatever. And it, it, there, there was no market research to uh, support spending that kind of money. And frankly, if not for the top executives of Travelers Insurance Company, uh, who Charles was able to convince to come along, I don't think it would have would have happened. <laughs> Yeah, that was a very, very important part of Sea Pines. You mentioned the red rocking chairs. I know he got pushback about those at the beginning, and some people just wanted to pull them out completely. And he's like, no, we're going to order more. But you also can't imagine Sea Pines without its famed bike paths. And Charles was quite visionary when he wanted to put them in, even though he had some of the nicest roads in the state. But he faced a lot of opposition for those, didn't he? Oh, he did. Uh, because people uh, at that point, you can think of, of people retiring into a, a gated community, just thinking of people who rode bikes as at that point, it wasn't as popularly known for personal wellness and exercise as it is today. But there was this feeling that if people were riding bikes along bike trails and you didn't know if suppose some of them could get, more easily get through the gates or whatever, or uh, visiting kids could ride along the bike trails and go into your house. The, the, it, there was just a real paranoia about a, a, a social level below where people were, that it didn't, didn't make any sense to have bike paths. There wasn't that much traffic anyway. If people wanted to ride a bike, they could just ride on the roads. And, you know, Charles had to deal with that kind of pushback in, 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 a, in a lot of places. One of the things that he left behind by doing that is the fact that there are only two gold star rated bicycle communities on the east coast of the United States. It's a very, very difficult rating to actually obtain. One of them, I believe, is down on the, the Gulf Coast of Florida. The other one's Hilton Head Island. Mm -hmm. Because of that foresight, he actually created one of the greatest bicycle communities on the East Coast of the United States, as well as probably the world. 
Oh, yeah. And we, you know, as forever grateful students, <laughs> we, you know, we have done the same thing here at, uh, at Spring Island. There, there are 26 miles of walking trails in a 1,800-acre wildlife preserve, and then there are another 18 miles or so of bicycle trails around the island, and and it's it allows people to be out and be in touch with nature. To be uh, and 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 there again, Charles was uh, ahead of his his time. When you talk about what he did to put land aside, in I think we've mentioned this before, it, it was the first planned community to have land set aside uh, for nature. It's part of the essence and feeling of being in the place, if you will. There were a lot of challenges along the way in developing sea pines. What, <laughs> and a lot of them had to do with getting permits and getting government to go along with doing things and dredging the harbor and using some of that to you know, fill in to make the 18th hole for the Harbor Town course. What did he think of bureaucracy? Well, it, it was he really thought a bureaucracy was about doubters that there was a lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding, and the people who who just didn't want change. And he felt that you, again, you continue to try to educate and be interested in what can be better. And he was very frustrated and very impatient with bureaucracy, but then would take the time to try to understand what their fears were and expose any, you know, selfishness or whatever. But it was about education and understanding that the change he was proposing was frankly going to be positive for everyone. But he he was, Jay, he, when I describe Charles, you know, the first thing I mentioned was what I felt after my first 30 minutes with him was how incredibly brilliant he was. And he had an insatiable appetite for understanding change and understanding uh, people's behavior. And that appetite led him to, to be aware of changes that were on the forefront. So he was often so far ahead of where anybody else, including world-class planners. But, the, you know, this thing about design with nature, this this thing, and Charles, you know, didn't do, he was not a lot of uh, outdoor person. He didn't do a lot of hiking or camping <laughs> or canoeing or anything, but the, he had read E.O. Wilson's book on the biophilia hypothesis and the bond between humans and other living systems and that we are genetically predisposed to be connected to nature. And frankly, out of intelligence and intellectual curiosity, Charles had had that premonition even before reading Wilson's book. So here he was in Sea Pines dedicating a nature preserve, and it was the first planned community in the United States to do a nature preserve. It was just another example of his intellectual curiosity and his desire to focus not just on selling lots or not just on what something looked like, but what was the experience of being in the place. While he was not a golfer, tennis player, hiker, he did like to sail. Yes. You had the opportunity <laughs> to sail with Mr. Fraser on his boat, the Compass Rose. One of those trips left quite an impression on you and not necessarily in a good way. <laughs> well, Charles did love sailing. And again, it was the, it, it, this intellectual curiosity about how, why did people love it so much and how did they do it? It even got Ted Turner down here. The old, All the America's Cup people came down to Sea Pines at his invitation. And so Charles loved the sailing, but, but frankly thought of himself as a little bit 
better sailor than he was. And uh, uh, we enjoyed, he, he used those many Sunday afternoons to get us younger members of his team together on the boat with people he was inviting to go that he wanted us to meet and know. And th- there was a wonderful boat captain that, that sailed the boat 80% of the time, but occasionally Charles just wanted to take uh, take the wheel and show that he could also uh, do the sailing. And one day I was with him, I was chatting with one of the people that, uh, that he had invited me to come meet. And all of a sudden, the words, heartily, came out. But what he had forgotten to say was, prepare to come about. <laughs> so when he said heartily, the bow swung over and knocked me off of the <laughs> center portion of the cabin roof <laughs> of the boat. <laughs> Fortunately, I only got bruised a bit, but it did, didn't break anything. <laughs> but he was very, very apologetic and said that it, it left a lasting impression. He said, I just want to thank you for being at the heart of my never doing that again. <laughs> <laughs> When most people think of Charles Frazier and make comparisons, they compare him to uh, Frederick Olmsted. What Olmsted did for parks, Frazier did for sustainable development and responsible development. You actually compared Charles Frazier to Steve Jobs from Apple. Why did you make that comparison? Well, because Steve Jobs didn't invent the computer. He didn't invent smartphones. But what he saw was what they could do and what the impact they could have on human lives and how that industry would grow if computers and smartphones were part of human behavior and growing. And that's what Charles did. When he understood human behavior or a trend towards something he made available to a larger segment of the market. So Steve took, okay, here's these computers, here's this smartphone, But what do I do to make the market aware of it and make a huge business out of it? And Charles uh, said, "Okay, here's what we know about human behavior and their relationship to recreation, retirement, connection to nature, et cetera. Now, how do we expand that into the evolution of human settlements? How do we make that part of our product? There were very few people that influenced Charles, but one of them was his wife, Mary. Can you tell us a little bit about her? Mary was terrific. And while she was uh, thoughtful and loving, there were very few people more than Mary who let him know. Let me just say, Mary let him know in no uncertain terms what she thought. And she gave him wonderful advice. I don't ever remember her being uh, disrespectful or showing any negative emotion to Charles when we were in company together. And yet, I can tell you that many, many times Charles would say, well, I thought this, but here's what Mary told me. (laughs) You know, she spoke her mind and we came to learn that she respectfully would speak her mind and focus on what she thought was important as much fun as Mary was to be with and thoughtful uh, friend. And we, we remained in contact with her and their daughters for many years. She would be very honest and straightforward with Charles. Both of them were very intellectual, very, very smart, very thoughtful. Mary cared an enormous amount, not just about sea pines, but about the entire Hilton Head community experience. It was her idea to bring a teacher to Hilton Head Island who had studied under Maria Montessori, And Mary started the Montessori School on Hilton Head in a house (laughs) near the beach, not too far from the old William Hilton Inn. (laughs) And, you know, both of our children went, went to school there. But that she had a sincere interest in learning and teaching and children having a quality experience on this little remote island. 
You've mentioned in the past that Charles was a great mentor. Would you share with us how he continued to mentor you even after you and Jim Light had left Sea Pines? I tell you, he he stayed in touch with us. It wasn't just, uh, and and he did this. His, his I would say his legacy wasn't just the places he created, but the future generations of people in the development business. He passionately and effectively mentored. And was cajoling challenge was not that we create uh, his vision or his dreams, but he would say, okay, create your own vision, dream your own dreams. And when we would be thinking about doing something in the mountains of Colorado or in the Pacific Northwest or whatever, you know, he would he would be curious and we would chat with him. But he always said, have the courage and tenacity to follow what your senses. And when we left, it wasn't, well, how can you be leaving? Why are you leaving? It was, go do your own vision, dream your own dreams, and have the tenacity to follow that where it leads you. And I'll, if I can find it, it just reminded me of a, when we had gotten started here on Spring Island and it finally put it together. And in June of 1998, we've been going for about seven or eight years then, he wrote a letter to Betsy and I. And if you don't mind, I'll read a couple of lines from it. Sure, go ahead. It says, Dear Jim and Betsy, you have done it. Capital IT. Spring Island is a far better part of God's earth than it was 10 years ago as a hunting plantation. Today, as a distinctive human settlement, there are those words again. It is now a great world place, a one-of-a-kind, unique, unforgettable place. It's a glorious accomplishment. The two of you and all the other talented and hardworking people who have helped you accomplish this extraordinary feat deserve all of the acclaim that flows your way from Spring Island. It means many different things to different people. I can only express my observations, and they are many. Spring Island reflects your extraordinary persistence in working unceasingly to carry out the one great dream and continuing attention to the dozens of smaller dreams. And you have spent years and years weaving the total dream. And and that's only about a third of the letter. It was so touching to us, but it's an example of here, he was not jealous that we had left and gone and done our own thing. And now we were doing something right in his backyard that was getting acclaimed. He was reveling in it. And I think that is, for me, my most uh, wonderful memory. It was he never, ever stopped mentoring or caring. It was really his gift. Charles met a very untimely death in a boat explosion in the Turks and Caicos while looking at a development. And while it was an extremely unfortunate event, it seems fitting for he was always about new adventures, wasn't he? Yes. I remember having that thought. Wow. There he was going after another dream. You know, there he was at that point in his life. He still had that insatiable curiosity. There he was. He was looking for potential, doing what he loved to do. If you could have one last conversation with Charles, what would it be about and what would your final words be to him? It would be it would be about the gift that he had given so many of us by, first of all, inspiring us, then challenging us, and then encouraging us. So he inspired us with all of his disciplined curiosity and research about how possible it was if you would be disciplined and thoughtful and curious and find out something that was really done well, it was okay to be second first. Charles talked about being second first. And just thanking him for his uh, unceasing curiosity and interest in what we were doing and his support. And I would say thank you. Thank you for being my mentor and for being both myself, Betsy, Jim, and Diane, for being our mentor, our strong supporter, and 
for never ceasing being our friend. Jim, I appreciate your time and and effort in coming to share these stories with us. Uh, Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. And again, thank you, Jay, for bringing a focus on the history and evolution of not just Sea Pines, but Hilton Head Island as a special human settlement. Thanks, Jim. If you enjoy this podcast, I invite you to subscribe and leave us a review. We will see you next time as we travel down 278 to Lighthouse Road. 